Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast. I am Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Today we're talking rules, but first, let's do some theater folk news. Photo call! We want your pictures. If you've done one of our plays, we want to see what you've done and how you've done it. First, I never get to see all of the productions of my plays because they are flung far and wide, and seeing my show in a series of pics just brings me right into the world of the production. I love it. Also, we want to show you off. We want to showcase your pictures on our blog and on our website. I love seeing how different productions interpret the same play. Further to that, pictures are such a great tool for those who are looking at a script and trying to visualize a certain point if they can read the scene and see the moment in a picture while that's like cake and candy all at the same time. So, please, please, please send us your production photos. You can email them to tfolk, that's T-F-O-L-K, at theaterfolk.com, tfolk at theaterfolk.com. Tell us what we're looking at and let us know that we can use them online. Lastly, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every Wednesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can also find us on the Stitcher app and you can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search on the word Theater Folk. <music> Episode 38, The Rules. So I did a uh, a blog post recently. I'm doing a lot of blog posts recently because I am stockpiling them because I'm going to England and there are no blogging elves that live in my computer and take care of these things. You know, I'm going away. Okay, blogging elves, keep things going. See you in two weeks. Ugh, that would be really lovely. <laughs> uh, something I, uh, I I often say, and uh, it's the only thing that I uh, dislike is not the right word. Unsettles me, uh, gives me tension. <laughs> it's the other thing about being self-employed and wishing I had a nine-to-five job is that if I had one of those... I could leave the job on Friday and not think about it till Monday. And then if I had one of those and I went away, somebody else, some elves in that line of work, would uh, cover things. There would be a temp or a substitute or something. But when you're self-employed, the only time that work happens is when you do it. And you can really fall into a trap of working all the time, For example, it's Sunday, and uh, what am I doing? I'm recording a podcast. There really isn't such a thing as a weekend. But then again, this is not coal mining. It's not really work. It's love. And at the heart of it, I know how to get things done so that I'm not falling into the the endless hamster wheel trap of always, 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 always working. And you just, you don't think about the big picture, about the the vast number of things that need to be done. I think about the small picture, you know, one blog post at a time, plodding along one day at a time, one podcast at a time. Ah, Yes, that's what we're doing here, right? Ha ha. So this podcast came out of a blog post that I wrote for the stockpile for England. And it was a post about writer's rules. Not the golden rule, not the the Ten Commandments kind of rule, but a uh, a, a collection of so called guidelines that are good to live by to make writing happen. And that's really the only reason to have rules. If if they're going to 
help, if they're going to um, guide you forward, you know, make writing happen. Rules that, that hem you in, that trap you to keep that going, well, they're, they're, it's meaningless. So in that particular blog post, Stockpile, England, I talked about the uh, writing rules for uh, that Kirk Vonnegut sort of came up with. So we'll leave that to the blog. Uh, look for it. And uh, we're going to look at the some rules of some others. So I've chosen a couple and we'll talk about them. And as we do, try to figure out what, what my rules are. Okay, so there you go. That was a recap of the podcast. You know what's coming. No surprises. Well, that'll ease the, the worry and the fraught that I'm sure is happening in all of your minds because I am, I am so big on surprises. Uh, and, uh, you know, winging things by the seat of my pants, right? <laughs> new cars for everyone in the audience. There are no new cars. Sorry. So it was interesting when I was looking around for the rules of writers, tons for novel writers, way less for uh, playwrights. Although almost everything that the uh, novelists had to say was applicable across the board. Uh, I just realized I didn't look up any rules for poets. Okay, so I'm going to rectify that before the end of this podcast. So, uh, so spigeth the podcaster or something like that. Okay. My favorite rule of the bunch came from, and I'm going to apologize now because I know I'm going to butcher this name, Verlin Kinkenborg. That is a wonderful name. <laughs> And I had no idea who he was, or I didn't even know it was a he, but he is a nonfiction writer and on the editorial board of the New York Times. So shame on me for not knowing who he was. And the rule of his that I like is listen to the voices inside your head. Now, he is not talking about the critic's voice, the voice that tells us that we suck and we're no good and it would be better for all the children of the world if we stopped writing, right? What he's talking about is it's the voice of thought, right? We all have this this voice in our head that just sort of boop, pops up in the unexpected moments and boop, you know, just sort of, you know, says something to us. The voice that says, what are those two people doing I wonder if it's something illegal. Boop. Right? That's the voice of thought. And every single human being has this voice of thought. It's just whether or not you're going to choose to A, listen to it or ignore it, and B, pluck it out of your head and do something with it. That's what writers do. We hone in and focus on the voice of thought and make the intangible tangible. If we want to, you know, if it's there for the plucking if you want to hear it and you want to listen to it, and you want to sort of sift through and see what's going to work for you and, and what's not. And also, playwrights, you can also take this uh, concept of listening to the voices in your head uh, a step further, and that's focusing on how words are going to sound once they're lifted off the page. When I write dialogue, I am always listening in my head to the characters have conversations. I hear the lines of dialogue as I'm, I'm typing or writing, and I just want to, it's a, a bizarre type of visualization, oralization, is that a word? I, I'm not, I'm, I just made it up, eh. or maybe not, I don't know. But I do this this thing so often that it's at the point now where I'm pretty good at seeing dialogue on the page, hearing it in my head, and being to guesstimate what that dialogue is going to sound like when somebody says it out loud. And for a playwright, it's really key. It's key to, to the sound of dialogue is what makes things a play, right? No silent reading in plays. Uh, and it doesn't matter what sentences look like. It matters what they sound like. Next one, uh, Sadie Sadie Smith, who I would say is most well known for her novel White Teeth, and I really like this one. I think <laughs> I think you'll all know why. Uh, don't romanticize your vocation. 
You can either write good sentences or you can't. There is no writer's lifestyle. All that matters is what you leave on the page. Of course I love this rule. Of course I do. It plays right into my, I'm too practical to be eccentric, galumphin, sullen, why can't I be like that sort of pout. But it's true, right? Yes. Oh, yes, Lindsay. Pat, pat, pat on the head. Yes, it's very true. Um, but it's, it's, it's really down to the basics of it, right? Um, you can talk about being a writer or you can make good sentences. You can work on making good sentences. You know, you can s- stand in the garret and smoke a cigarette and, uh, wave your, your scarves around and talk about what it's like to be a writer or you could write. You know, it's what's on the page. That is all that matters. Words on the page. If you're romanticizing what it means to be an artist, you're you're probably not working. It's like a dream world, and you cannot work in a dream. The majority of us can't, anyway. I think it's a great rule in the sense of do your job, treat it like a job, because it's the greatest job in the whole freaking world, right? It is the absolute greatest, but you can't think of it or see it as some kind of rom-com, you know, where, you know, the guys, the man and the woman meet in the middle of the street. There are no cars and no other people, funnily enough. And a song guaranteed to tuck at the heartstrings is playing and the kiss and the camera sweeps away and everyone lives happily ever after. And nah, doesn't, doesn't, no, don't do that. Don't, don't be the artist who romanticizes uh, what they do. Elmore Leonard has one that I think is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but I think very appropriate to place. And this is from his book, Ten Rules of Writing. He says, never open a book with the weather. The reader is apt to leaf ahead looking for people. Love that. I love that. I love that. Yes, look for the people. I truly believe, and I will say this, uh, up and down the, up and down the stairs, up and down the hallways, that the best plays are character driven. If there is an issue, a concept, a historical point, an abstraction, it has to be funneled through character reaction. And not just that, the emotional reaction of the characters. Characters are what audiences connect to, relate to, react to. That is what I believe. That is what I'm sticking to. So look for the people in your work. Where are they? What are they doing? What are they doing to each other? Um, that is what I think is going to make your work really sing. Because frankly, who cares about the weather? We should probably talk to some playwrights. Okay. Arthur Miller once said that when you can't create, you can work. Well, that goes hand in hand with uh, Sadie back there. Art is a job. Art is work. Don't romanticize. Do the work. Do your job. Get it done. And remember, it is the greatest job on the whole freaking planet, right? He also says, uh, don't be a, a draft horse. Work with pleasure only, which is a kind of neat companion, right? So yes, we're like, you know, I'm very much hammering the, hammering the drum of do your work, do your work, don't romanticize, do your work. But it should also be a joy to work. You should love your work. Work with pleasure, man. Like, if you love what you do, it is so easy to do it. And that's the key, right? We want to find avenues to to treat this job, the greatest job in the whole freaking world, uh, with love and with um with joy, because then then all of a sudden it's not work, right? That's the key. Neil Simon said this in uh, the New York Times in 1992. Uh, If I were to write this play, I ask myself and fulfill all of its promise on each and every page and carry the play and its characters to their richest potential. Just how good a play can this be? I like this because it's about giving importance and weight to what you're doing. Are you really going to spend maybe a year, maybe more, and find this work worthwhile? Think that it has value? 
Value is really important because, you know, value is, there's lots of value in all kinds of different things. There's value in making people laugh. There's value in making people think. It all just depends on, on what your, what your thing is, right? But thinking that your work has value, that yes, I am going to spend a year on it and uh, it's going to be groovy. You know, that is a good rule to live by. So what about me? What are my rules? Well, I think, uh, as I've been going through this, uh, funnily enough, um, a lot of what I believe has been illustrated in the rules that I've chosen here. Hmm. Interesting how that happened. Hmm, it's almost like I'm the one who uh, designed that to happen. Whoa, ha, 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 ha. Yes, I'm doing evil fingers in front of the microphone that you can't see. And um, I think every writer should take to heart that there is no one rule that defines what it means to be a writer. And what I mean by that is we often get overwhelmed by what other writers do and think that if I'm going to be a writer, if I'm going to be a dancer, if I'm going to be an actor, I have to do what they do. I have to be at uh, 26. Uh, I have to, I have to, I have to have done as many plays or I have to have done as many movies or I have to be in as many, you know, pieces as so and so over there. And if I'm not, then I'm not successful. Then I'm failing, you know, or that just the process of it, if, uh, there is no one way to, uh, complete the process of writing. And it's, uh, it, it, it's not good to think that there is a, a hard, fast, set rule towards that. That the writer must write eight hours a day, you know, stamped at no erases. That the writer must write ten pages every day. That the writer must only write serious works. That the writer must, the writer must, the writer must. What works for writer A works for writer A. And that's it. You have to determine what works for you. You need your own process. And so to that end, the really, the only rule that the writer must follow is writer's right. Huh? Writer's right. If you write one word and you write one word every day, you're a writer. Will you, it take you a long time to finish something? Sure. But, you know, so what? There is no rule that says you have to write 17 projects in a year. You just have to write. Words on the page. Don't talk about writing. Don't uh, be the uh, the romanticized version of a writer. Put words on the page. Good words, bad words, ugly words. And then rewrite those words. And then move them forward. That's the my one rule. Writers write. Words on the page. Every single word counts. Okay, and... If I had to add one more thing, it would be, uh, particularly if you are going to send your work out into the world, format your work properly. Yes, I am talking to you, texting generation, with your no punctuation and your no capitals and your short form spelling for everything. It is not cute. It is not appropriate. And yes, I know this makes me sound old. I can live with it. But it's, it's true. If you're going to send me something, I'm the I'm the I'm the gatekeeper of uh, submissions at Theater Folk. I read all the plays that come in the door, and if I have to wade through formatting issues, ah, uh, it kind of it says to me that you don't care whether or not you do. All I have is this work that's sitting in front of me, and I'm not going to uh, pay attention to your content if you haven't paid attention to your format. End of story. Same thing goes for not sending a proper cover letter. Emails. You can do a proper cover letter with dear so-and-so and and sincerely so-and-so at the end. You have to care enough to tell me who you are and what your work is about. uh, Because otherwise, why why would I care? Right? And I'm going to end this this, uh, little jaunt through writer's rules with Margaret Atwood. Now, I love me some Margaret Atwood. Uh, the Handmaid's Tale is one of my favorites. Um, I don't love all of her books, and uh, it, I find her very hard to watch in in, in interviews. Uh, it just 
sometimes it really comes across to me as kind of totally humorless, which, you know, I don't know. You need some humor, right? It makes me a little sad. But then I came across these uh, rules that she wrote, her take on the rules of the writer, and I think they're lovely and very tongue-in-cheek. So, shame on me for being all judgy-judgy about Miss Margaret Atwood. So, here we go. One. Take a pencil to write on airplanes. Pens leak. But if the pencil breaks, you can't sharpen it on the plane because you can't take knives with you. Therefore, take two pencils. Okay, so I look at this one, which I find very, very funny, but then my first thought is, pencil sharpener? Okay, don't judge. See, I'm judgy. I'm a very judgy person. Stop that. Okay, two, take something to write on. Paper is good. In a pinch, pieces of wood or your arm will do. Really, there is no panic like not having a piece of paper when you want to write something down. I love this. I'm I'm not going to carry wood around, but I, oh, the number of times I've had to pull out some napkins or some, or some something, anything. Three, do back exercises. Pain is distracting. Got that. Four, you most likely need a thesaurus, a rudimentary grammar book, and a grip on reality. This later means, this latter means, there's no free lunch. Writing is work. It's also gambling. You don't get a pension plan. Other people can help a bit, but essentially, you're on your own. Nobody's making you do this. You chose it. So don't whine. Amen, Miss Atwood. It's not coal mining, right? Do your thing. And that... And that is where we're going to... I said I was going to do some poet rules. Okay, hold on. I'll be right back. Sing the Jeopardy theme song in your head. Go. Okay. Through the magic of the uh, trim feature, I am now instantly back with something actually very funny. Okay. So these rules are from anti-natural.org. Uh, it's the top of the page says 15 Credibility Street. Head over there as I'm not going to do all of the rules, but uh, this is entitled Rules for the Poets Now That Anyone Can Write. If you use the word soul, you will be shot. I can hear them. I can hear the shots ringing out. Rhymes are appropriate to children's books and high school creative writing assignments. Formulae are beautiful only in mathematics. All nights are not endless. All rains are not gentle. All skies not azure. And so on and so on. Azure? Azure. It is not a poem just because the line ends before the punctuation. The world does not need another poem about a bad relationship. Save it for the diary. You would not invite your friends over and serve them rancid food and sour wine. Why not? Because you care about them and you don't want to see them suffer. Have mercy. Discipline yourself. <laughs> And that is where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.